Well, good evening, CHBC, and all those who are tuning in and uh, listening and watching. Uh, I'd just like to invite you now to open up your Bibles, to turn with me uh, to John chapter 19. John chapter 19, and we'll read uh, from verse 31 to 42. John 19, 31 to 42. It reads, Now it was the day of preparation, and the next day was to be a special Sabbath. Because because the Jews did not want the bodies left on the crosses during the Sabbath, they asked Pilate to have the legs broken and the bodies taken down. The soldiers therefore came and broke the legs of the first man who had been crucified with Jesus, and then those of the other. But when they came to Jesus and found that he was already dead, they did not break his legs. Instead, one of the soldiers pierced Jesus' side with a spear, bringing a sudden flow of blood and water. The man who saw it has given testimony, and his testimony is true. He knows that he tells the truth, and he testifies so that you also may believe. These things happen so that the scripture would be fulfilled. Not one of his bones will be broken. And as another scripture says, they will look on the one they have pierced. Later, Joseph of Arimathea asked Pilate for the body of Jesus. Now, Joseph was a disciple of Jesus, but secretly because he feared the Jews. With Pilate's permission, he came and took the body away. He was accompanied by Nicodemus, the man who had earlier visited Jesus at night. Nicodemus had brought a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about 34 kilograms. Taking Jesus' body, the two of them wrapped it with the spices in strips of linen. This was in accordance with Jewish burial customs. At the place where Jesus was crucified, there was a garden, and in the garden a new tomb, in which no one had ever been laid. Because it was a Jewish day of preparation, and since the tomb was nearby, they laid Jesus there. Let's pray. Father, we come before you and we just thank you so much for another opportunity now to open your word and God we humbly ask you that you would uh, give us eyes to see into your word to understand it God you have a message for each of us to hear tonight and I pray that we would all hear it cause us to see the wondrous things that are in your word may we leave forever changed and may you uh, be in our lives Uh, the great desire of our heart we pray that you would bring a transformation in our lives may we leave and may we move on from here rejoicing in God our savior lord may you bless the reading and preaching of your word to our lives now in Jesus name amen well I just want to read one uh, verse uh, for you uh, and I think it'll really illuminate what we see here in this account in John 19. Now, the verse is found in 2 Corinthians 2.15. Don't turn there. I'll just read it. Paul says this, For we are to God the pleasing aroma of Christ among those who are being saved and among those who are perishing. To the one group, we are an aroma that brings death. To the other, an aroma that brings life. Now, really, this is the effect that Christ has on this world. And Paul says this, too, is the effect that we have on this world because Christ is in us. And now I think that this passage that we have, that we're looking at tonight, really shows this effect that Christ has on the world, the different effects he has. So firstly, uh, I want us to consider uh, that Jesus' death agitates sinners. Jesus' death agitates sinners. Look at verse 31. Now it was the day of preparation and the next day was to be a special Sabbath. Because the Jews did not want the bodies left on the crosses during the Sabbath, they asked Pilate to have the legs broken and the bodies taken down. So Jesus has been crucified on a Friday and we see that because the next day was to be a Sabbath. So that really helps us figure out that he was crucified on a Friday But notice he says it's not just any kind of Sabbath that is to come the next day. He says it's a special Sabbath. Why a special Sabbath? 
Well, the author has been reminding us all these events are happening during Passover week, the most important event on the Jewish calendar. Jerusalem would be packed with Jews traveling from all different regions, regions staying there that week. And so that makes this Sabbath, because it falls in Passover week, an even more special Sabbath than what Sabbaths normally are. And John here reintroduces the Jews. Now, when he says the Jews here, John's specifically referring to the religious leaders. Now, what's interesting is these are the religious leaders who relentlessly fought and fought with Pilate, who urged and urged Pilate to bring about Jesus' death. Eventually, they got to the point where they blackmailed Pilate, threatening him that they would appeal to Caesar and say that Pilate is siding with Jesus, who is a threat to the throne. Finally, they get their way. The chief priests and the scribes and the Pharisees, they get what they want, and they finally have Jesus killed. They actually do it. They bring it about. They kill him. And yet, what do we see here in these verses? They are still uh, at unrest. They still have no peace. They're still agitated. Jesus is hanging on the cross as, as it's unfolding here. And they're still deeply bothered by him. And he is still a burden to them. And so they come again now to Pilate seeking a hearing. So what, what problem does Jesus present for them now? Well, it says they did not want the bodies left on the crosses during the Sabbath, so they asked Pilate to have the legs broken and the bodies taken down. Why did they not want to allow the bodies to remain on the cross during the Sabbath the next day? Well, this would be this would be to break one of the commands that God gave in Deuteronomy chapter twenty-one. Verse 22, it says this, If someone is guilty of a capital offense and you hang him on a tree, you must not leave the body hanging on the tree overnight. Be sure to bury it that same day because anyone who is hung on a tree is under God's curse. You must not desecrate the land the Lord your God is giving you as an inheritance. See, if someone was hung upon a tree, they were under God's curse. And yet God says, if you leave them on that tree overnight, you invite my curse upon your land. And so the religious leaders didn't want this. They know this command. They didn't want it. And they especially didn't want it to happen on a special Sabbath. It made the, it made the problem even greater. And so the religious leaders, they face this, this problem that Jesus brings. And it's a problem because crucifixion, Roman crucifixion, could last up to two to three days before the victim died. Jesus was definitely going to be up there, for, definitely through the Sabbath and maybe, maybe the next day after that. And even when he did die, the Romans often left the crucified bodies on the crosses for vultures to eat and devour. And this would be a a deeply confronting visual sign for everyone who passed by. You do not mess with Rome. But the religious leaders have this problem because the Old Testament law forbids them to keep a body on the cross. And they were the ones that put Jesus on there. So even now, as Jesus is on the cross, he is still presenting a problem to them. What were they to do? Well, the answer would be cruri fragium. Now, what is that? Well, this was a practice that the Romans occasionally did uh, after crucifixion. If they wanted to speed up the process, they would uh, break the victim's legs to kill them quicker. Now, this, this involved taking an iron mallet and they would swing it and break, crushing uh, the victim's legs while they were hanging on the cross. Now, this would bring about the death quicker for a number of reasons. The initial shock and trauma that would be brought upon the victim when their legs, the bones shattered, would, would immediately speed up the death process. But on top of that, as they were hanging on that cross and drooping down, they relied on their legs to push themselves up so that they could open their lungs just to take a breath. Well, with shattered legs, they couldn't push themselves up. They would die of suffocation. They would die of asphyx asphyxiation. So this, this method here became the religious leader's only hope. And so it's this appeal that they come hassling Pilate with. 
And, and as you consider this, you, you cannot help but think how appalling are these religious leaders. They are absolutely, positively religious hypocrites. They don't, they don't want to break the command of Deuteronomy 21, but they have no problem breaking the legs of the Son of God. They don't want to risk inviting God's curse upon their land. And yet they rejoice to curse the Son of God to his face. They want to be able to enjoy their Sabbath rest the next day. But they haven't been able to rest the last three years until they'd finally murdered the Son of God. Rightly when Jesus was alive, Matthew 23, John chapter 8, rightly did he call them hypocrites, You hypocrites, you sons of hell, you brood of vipers, you whitewashed tombs. You are of your father, the devil, and you want to carry out his desires. He was a murderer from the beginning. You murderers. This is exactly who they were. And so even while Jesus is hanging on the cross, he is still a hindrance to them. He is still a problem to them. He is still an agitation to them. And can I tell you, nothing has changed today. Jesus has died. He's risen. He's in heaven. He's not here. And yet he continues to be a hindrance to this world now. The world is still, even now while he's not here, agitated by him. His authority and his commands, his words, his life is still an agitation to them. Let me ask you, is Jesus a hindrance to you? Does he agitate you? Does he stop you from doing what you really want? Do you wish that you could just indulge in pornography without the guilt of Christ coming upon you? Do you wish you could go and and participate in that adulterous relationship without the fear of hell hanging over you? Do, Do you wish that you could have your Sundays all to yourself? Is is he a hindrance to you? Do you think it would be great if there was just no heaven and no hell, just this life? Do you wish that discipleship to Christ could be a one-off transaction so that you could just go and live? Do you just do church and do prayer, but Jesus is a burden to you and he's actually stopping you from the desires of your heart? I wonder how many teenagers of parents in this church feel that way. He is a hindrance to them. And I wonder how many adults who perhaps regularly fill these pews and have done so for many years, Jesus is is actually a hindrance to what they really want and what they really wish they could do. Is that you, you who, are, you who are listening tonight, you who are listening right now, which of you has the courage to show your true colors like these religious leaders and say that Jesus is a hindrance to me? If that's the reality, may God have mercy on your soul that is heading to hell. But if you can acknowledge it, if you can actually acknowledge that he is a hindrance, may that be the first steps taken towards repentance and you receiving mercy from him tonight. Jesus agitates sinners and is a hindrance. Surprisingly, Pilate grants their request. Look at verse 32. The soldiers therefore came and broke the legs of the first man who had been crucified with Jesus and then those of the other. So the leg smashing executions begin and they begin with one on one side and then they deal with the next criminal who's crucified on the other side of Jesus and undoubtedly the screams that would have come from these men's mouths would have sent shivers down the spine as everyone for everyone who was looking on. But this leads us to what I want us to consider next. Our next point, Jesus' death fulfilled the scriptures. 
His death fulfilled the scriptures. We see something unexpected happen. Look at verse 33. But when they came to Jesus and found that he was already dead, they did not break his legs. Now the soldiers approached Jesus with mallet in hand, ready to break his legs, only to find that he's already dead. Now, this is a uniquely quick death for a, for a crucifixion. Crucifixion, as we said, usually lasted two to three days. But we know from the New Testament records that Jesus died, uh, he, he was crucified, sorry, at the third hour until the ninth hour. So Jesus was on the cross approximately six hours. This is very quick for crucifixion before dying. Why was it so quick? Well, I think there's two reasons here. Why did he die so quickly? I think one of the main reasons is because of the severe torture that he experienced during his trial. Remember, Pilate didn't want to crucify him. And so one of his efforts was to kind of satisfy Jesus' enemies. And he, and he uh, handed Jesus over to the dreaded verba ratio, that flogging with, with leather whips that had the bits of glass and bone and metal attached to it and teeth attached to it and, and that would rip through the flesh of the victim and would often cause victims to die just from that flogging. Well, Jesus received all that and all the other abuse and beatings during his trial. But I think there's also another reason why he died so quickly. Look at verse 30. I don't think we can pass verse 30, what Ian had preached on last week. Verse 30, when he had received the drink, Jesus says, said, it is finished. With that, he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. You see, Jesus knew the very moment when God's wrath was satisfied. Jesus knew the very moment when he had finished bearing the penalty for the sins of man. He knew when that was done. And in that moment, when it was done, he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. These are reasons why he died so quickly. So Jesus, out of the three of those who were crucified, Jesus is the only one that doesn't have his legs broken. And, and shortly, John is going to show us the significance of that. But one soldier is hasty and perhaps aggressive and, and just brutal by nature. Look what one of the soldiers does, verse 34. Instead of, of breaking the legs, instead, one of the soldiers pierced Jesus' side with a spear, bringing a sudden flow of blood and water. Now, perhaps he wanted to further the abuse and the mistreatment and the shame and the anguish brought upon this one who claimed to be the king of the Jews. And this soldier who perhaps had already been mocking him now grabs a spear and thrusts it through Jesus' side. This is a, this is a harsh move. This is a, a violent act, a graphic act. And he pierces Jesus' side. And yet these seemingly insignificant or incidental details aren't insignificant and incidental at all. And John actually says they're very important. And he wants us to see how important they are. Look at verse 36 and verse 37. These things happened so that the scripture would be fulfilled. Not one of his bones will be broken. And as another scripture says, they will look on the one they have pierced. So these seemingly two incidental things that happened to Jesus, the not breaking of his legs and the piercing of his side, these things were prophesied in the Old Testament. Why is this so important? Because we've seen this over and over in this series of John. That, that Jesus is, is being given over to the brutal hands of wicked men and they are committing atrocities against him. But we see simultaneously that everything that is befalling Jesus is happening according to the predetermined plan of God. And so we, we've continually seen, and we see it even here, as Jesus is surrounded by his enemies on his trial and now even on the cross. Who is the one that is in control? God and Christ. This has all been prophesied. And so these things happen so that the scriptures would be fulfilled, it says. The first scripture fulfilled is that not one of his bones will be broken. And this was prophesied word for word in Psalm 34, 19 to 20. And in there, David is speaking of the righteous man. God will not even allow one of his bones to be broken. 
Jesus is the fulfillment of that righteous man and God doesn't allow his bones to be broken. But I think there's a deeper, even deeper scriptural fulfillment there. And, and it's referring to the Passover. Remember, John has been emphasizing as the author that this is happening during Passover week. Now, what happened at Passover? Look what God says on two different occasions. Exodus 12, 46 and Numbers 9. God says this to the Israelites. The Passover lamb must be eaten in the house. Take none of the meat outside. Do not break any of the bones. John is reminding us it's Passover week. So remember, he starts off in chapter 1 in his gospel saying, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And now at the very end of his life when he's on the cross, having died, he says not one of his bones was broken. John's pointing and he's saying he is the Passover Lamb. It's all been fulfilled. He's here and it's done. And so what's amazing is even this rough and rash and brutal treatment by the soldiers, by spearing Jesus into his side, it was all prophesied. Scripture says, it also says in verse 37, the second uh, fulfillment here, they will look on the one they have pierced. So, So again, even that moment of the soldier stabbing him through with the spear, that was prophesied. Where was that prophesied in? Well, that's a direct quote from Zechariah 12.10. And in that chapter, those words are spoken. And God, it's referring to God's shepherd being pierced by the people as they look at him. Now, as we look at these scriptures being fulfilled and John doing this, I, I think really the point is that we should have great confidence in Jesus' death. That that first prophecy happened some 1,000 years earlier and it's fulfilled on the cross. That second prophecy in Zechariah, it's filled 500 years earlier and then fulfilled on the cross. Everything has been leading to this moment. All of history was getting to this moment. And so John wants to see if you have any doubts about Jesus' death, look at this and then cast your doubts to the wind. This one who is on the cross, John is saying he is the one and only Savior given by God. It's finally fulfilled in him. There is no other help to come. No other help is on its way. It's all being fulfilled before his eyes. I think also here, some application for us, it it really confirms the authenticity of the Old Testament. God here exalts his word. That which he says, God has ensured that every detail is fulfilled and will be fulfilled. You see it even in Jesus' life. He was so careful to fulfill all the scriptures that were concerned about him. Understand, the Old Testament is important. So let us not disregard the Old Testament that God and Christ put so much honor upon. Don't disregard the Old Testament. Thirdly, the application, I think, from this section here is that his word is reliable and sufficient. Some of you, I I can say, and that even though I don't know, I can say some of you are going through some weighty trials that I know nothing about, things that are weighing you down, and through it all, you, you just don't feel God, and you're not getting any direct answers to your petitions and to your prayers. You're not feeling or sensing anything. All you have is the Word of God. You have no other prop holding you up. You're just left with the Word of God. And can I say to you, hold on to the Word. All you have is his word that tells you who he is and what his promises to you are. Hold on to that word. Remember Jesus says, heaven and earth will pass away, but not one of my words will. Hang on to his word. He shows that he puts great honor upon it here. So we see scripture fulfilled. But another surprising detail that only John adds, look at verse 34. Instead, one of the soldiers pierced Jesus' side with a spear, bringing a sudden flow of blood and water. Bringing a sudden flow of blood and water. Now, 
This is unique to John's gospel, and it's surprising because we'd expect a, uh, if Jesus gets speed, we'd expect a gush of blood coming out. But what's, what's with the water? What, what, what's this water coming out? Well, there's been many attempts for medical uh, explanations of what's going on here with Jesus' body. Uh, it seems, I mean, there's, a, there's many views here, but it seems that because of the tremendous trauma and duress brought upon his heart, he had heart failure. And, and because of the trauma and the shock brought to his body, his, um, his pericardial sac began to fill with fluid. So once he was pierced, the blood came out, but also then a second substance came out, the water began to flow out. That fluid uh, flowed out from his side as well. Some believe that the moment of his death wasn't just brought on uh, by organ failure, but they think that the mental and spiritual agony and trauma that he went through brought about his death. And, And we see that trauma mentally and spiritually in the Garden of Gethsemane. So great was the turmoil that he was sweating drops of blood. He wasn't even at the cross yet. So what was it like when he actually bore our sins and the judgment of God? But these are medical kind of interpretations of what's going on here. But I think we need to consider the contextual motivations as to why John would include this. What was happening at the time that would make John want to write about this and put these details in? Well, when we consider his context, I think it becomes a bit clear. Now, the Gospel of John, he wrote it, it's believed, uh, somewhere between 90 and 100 AD. That's much later uh, than when, after Christ ascended. But during that period, there was a dangerous heresy that was beginning to infiltrate the early church. And the heresy was known as docetism. Now, docetism was the denial that Jesus was fully man. That he only appeared to be a man. He seemed to be a man. And because he wasn't truly, fully man, he didn't really actually die. He, He only appeared to die. So on the cross, when it seemed like he expired, it was just a mirage. But he didn't really die. Now, Islam has embraced this heresy. Muhammad adopted this heresy. Let me read you a portion of the Quran with one of his utterances. It says this in Surah 4, line 156. It says this, I'll quote the Quran. They did not kill him, Jesus. Neither did they crucify him. It only seemed to be so. They did not kill him for certain. End quote. Now, this utterance from Muhammad It was recorded historically. It's fact, it was recorded in 600 AD, some 600 years after Christ was actually hanging on that cross. I think I'm going to stick with John's account instead of Muhammad's. But what's interesting is that it's commonly agreed among scholars that Muhammad gained his information and knowledge about Christianity. Christianity by those who are proponents of docetism. But John is saying, as his heresy is starting to spread, John's saying the soldiers didn't break his legs because he was already dead. But then he says even one of them speared him to even further guarantee that he was dead and water and blood flowed out. If Jesus wasn't a man, that wouldn't have happened. It wouldn't have happened. So I will accept John's testimony. John's context here is is the denial of Jesus' death, and he's saying, I saw it. But one last thing on the water and blood. We've seen the medical kind of explanations of this water and blood flowing out. We've seen the contextual reason for it, but there's also a a theological and gospel symbolism present in this description John gives. Now, Christians right throughout history have seen gospel significance in this vivid photo that John is portraying for us here. Now, the water, water is a prominent theme in John's gospel. Remember in John chapter 3, Jesus said, unless one is born of water and the spirit, he will not enter the kingdom of God. And then in John chapter 4, when Jesus is talking to the woman at the well, he offers her living water. And then he says to her, the water I will give will become a spring of water welling up to eternal life. And then in John chapter 7, verse 
37, Jesus at the great feast. And it says, he stood up and he shouted, if anyone is thirsty, let, he come, let him come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, streams of living water will flow from within him. But this he meant concerning the spirit. See, water in John's gospel represents and, and, and symbolizes the Holy Spirit. It resembles renewal, purification, rebirth. Tremendous significance here. And blood, well, that's just obvious. We really don't need to say much about it. So what could, to the Jew who's reading this, what symbolized purification more than water? And to the Jew reading this, what symbolized atonement more than blood? And this is what John describes here. And so Christians, not just Jews, Christians couldn't miss this either. And they couldn't miss the gospel significance in it. And so that's why countless hymns have been written containing the significance of the water and the blood. Symbolically, we sing one of them. Rock of ages, cleft for me. Let me hide myself in thee. Let the water... And the blood from thy um, riven side which flowed be for sin the double cure. Cleanse me from its guilt and power. The water and the blood make it a double cure for sin's guilt and power in my life. There's other hymns. Um, but this is, I think this is just so clear here. And we saw the prophecies taken from Zechariah, chapter 12, verse 10. Do you know what the very next lines are in Zechariah after this prophecy? It says this, On that day a fountain will be opened to cleanse from sin and impurity. On the cross, a fountain was opened so that any who come, any who come and wash in the blood, any who come underneath that fountain will find forgiveness and eternal life. It's wonderful. How much, how much has John given us here by the Holy Spirit's inspiration? How much in these words has he painted for us? But, but understand this. He has not recorded this for our intellectual stimulation. John would immediately protest and say, far be it, far be it from just being that. And this leads to my next point. The next point is that Jesus' death calls for a response. Jesus' death calls for a response. Listen to the wording of the author. It's almost as if he's tongue-tied. Look at verse 35. The man who saw it, now he's speaking in third person. The man who saw it has given testimony and his testimony is true. He knows that he tells the truth and he testifies so that you also may believe. It, look at the wording of that. It's as if John is putting himself on trial and he's asking himself, John, do you swear to tell the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth? And John stands up and says, yes, I do. I swear what I testify and what I've seen with my eyes, it's true. It's absolutely true. Why has John written all of this? Why is he testifying? Why is he bearing witness? It's not because he loves to write. It's not because he's got a lot of spare time. It's not because he's just an eyewitness and he needs to file a report. No, he says there, I testify so that you may believe so that you may believe. John wrote these words so that he would get a response, so that there would be a response. He wrote so that people would be saved. He wrote that so those who read this would be saved. He wrote for all of you who are listening that you would be saved, that you would believe. Now, as you're listening tonight, you may, have not, you, you may have not asked for this. You may have not come looking for it. You, the greatest and most significant event in history, though you weren't looking for it, it has come looking for you tonight. And its demand is a response. It's come to you and now it brings you at a point of crossroads. It places you in the valley of decision and you must decide what you do with Jesus. 
You must come to a decision. John is appealing. I testify so that you may believe. He really died. I saw it. He died. He actually, actually died. And he didn't die as some kind of victim. He tasted death for us. He died to be our substitute to save us. And John's saying, believe in him. Oh, believe in him. I write and I labor so you would believe in him. Relinquish your reliance upon your self-righteousness and your goodness and believe in the Son who died for our sins. The decision is yours. You must come and believe. This leads to our last point tonight. The last point is Jesus' death brings life. Jesus' death brings light. Now the narrative events progress and and John introduces us to someone. Look at verse 38. Later, Joseph of Arimathea asked Pilate for the body of Jesus. Now Joseph was a disciple of Jesus, but secretly because he feared the Jews. With Pilate's permission, he came and took the body away. Now, Now Joseph appears in all four Gospels. And they say that he was a wealthy man. He was part of the religious council. So he was probably uh, um, part of the Sanhedrin. He was a religious leader. But it also says that he was a devout and noble man looking for the kingdom of God. Matthew and John say that he was a disciple of Jesus. But do you notice the little detail John gives? He added, he was a disciple of Jesus, but secretly because he feared the Jews, the religious leaders. Being a religious leader put him in a very difficult spot. And so he he became a secret disciple. But when you read John's gospel, John doesn't speak very well about secret disciples at all. But but Joseph has, has come to believe in Jesus, but he's afraid. As one of the religious leaders, look at John chapter 12, 42. It says, many among the leaders believed in Jesus, but because of the Pharisees, they would not confess their faith for fear they'd be put out of the synagogue, for they love the praise from men more than praise from God. See, John, Joseph didn't vote yes for Jesus to be killed, but he didn't stand up in allegiance with Christ. And yet here we see him approaching Pilate, seeking to give Jesus a proper burial. Now, this is very significant because those criminals who were executed for sedition against Rome, which Jesus was executed for that reason, they were denied a burial from their family members. And what would happen is they'd be buried outside the city with other criminals. Now, Joseph approaches Pilate and asks for an exception. Do you understand how risky and costly this was for Joseph? Pilate had just sentenced Jesus to death. The religious leaders would have found out about this. He would have lost his position. He would have been stripped of his credentials. He would have been kicked out of the synagogues. He would have been ostracized. But now, this one secret disciple has now counted the cost and he comes out of the closet And he identifies with Christ. And it's the death of Christ that takes him out of his his comfort zone. The death of Christ. In the moment of Jesus' death, he comes out to confess his faith. Pilate obliges amazingly. But John adds that Simon wasn't alone in asking for this. There was someone that joined Simon. Have a look at verse 39. He was accompanied by Nicodemus, the man who had earlier visited Jesus at night. Nicodemus brought a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about 34 kilograms worth. Now, Nicodemus was a religious leader too, and he was a Pharisee. Now, he appeared in chapter 3, but look at the, already in John's gospel, but look at the detail now that John gives us in recalling who Nicodemus was. He says, do you remember? He was the one who had earlier visited Jesus at night. Now, why, does, why did he emphasize, emphasize that Nicodemus is the one that visited Jesus at night? Why did he visit Jesus at night? Well, the answer is obvious. He didn't want to be seen with Jesus. He didn't want the other religious leaders to see that he was with Jesus. What's John showing us? Here is another secret disciple who's afraid to be seen with Jesus. But unlike Simon, this is now the third time that John's written 
about Nicodemus. The first time in John chapter 3, in secret. In John chapter 7, when they're trying to arrest Jesus and they're plotting and planning, Nicodemus kind of says, shouldn't Jesus receive a fair hearing before we arrest him? But now, where is he now? He's out of the closet. He's come out of the closet. He's approaching Pilate as well he risks his neck he risks everything he risks his life both of these men Simon and Nicodemus they struggled with the cost of discipleship but now we see precious 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 unashamed disciples of Christ you see you look at them and you read of them here they approach Pilate They risk the fury of the religious leaders. They risk their lives and watch them as they march up to Calvary. They walk up their hill to go and attend to their master. They're out of the closet now. And what a sight that we see here of these two men. What what imagery, what a moment this is as they go and take the body of Jesus down. Imagine and watch as they are trying to remove the nails from his hands, as they're trying to free his feet from the nails that pierce and plunge them into that wood. You see them, how are they trying to delicately remove the crown of thorns plunged into his head and as they remove the nails and the crown, can you just picture the lifeless body of Christ, his corpse falling upon them? Literally, literally, they are covered in Jesus' blood all over them. What a moment this was for these two men to hold the Son of God, their Lord, like this, dead and lifeless. What a moment this was. Anyone who would presume that tears weren't streaming down these men's faces Who could deny that that would have been the case? What a moment. It says Nicodemus brought about 34 kilos of myrrh and aloes. This is a huge amount. This is a huge amount for burial of spices and fragrance. Huge. Such an amount, such an exorbitant amount, such a huge amount would only be used for kings or nobility. The fragrances were obviously to help the odour when the body uh, of the deceased began to decay. And so they brought fragrances. This shows us that the resurrection was going to be a big surprise for these two men. Look at verse 40 to 42 as the passage ends. Taking Jesus' body, the two of them wrapped it with the spices and strips of linen. This is in accordance with Jewish burial customs. At the place where Jesus was crucified, there was a garden. In the garden, a new tomb in which no one had ever been laid because it was a Jewish day of preparation. And since the tomb was nearby, they laid Jesus there. The other gospels tell us that this garden was supplied by Joseph. Either he had already owned it or he had purchased it on the spot immediately. Either way, this was very, very costly. Such a tomb wouldn't be cheap in a garden like this, never used. These two wealthy disciples glorify Christ. Joseph supplies the tomb. Nicodemus supplies the spices and fragrances for burial. Now we talk so much about Jesus' death and his resurrection mostly gets mentioned at Easter, but very little talk is given about his burial. But what a visual scene we are left with here. You you watch these men as they're preparing Jesus' body for burial. They're cleansing, they're washing, they're preparing and wrapping his body. Jesus had washed them in his blood and now they were washing away the blood from his body. Jesus had provided them with cleansing and now they're cleaning him up. It was by his wounds that they were healed and now they are bandaging up his wounds. This was worship. This was worship that they were involved in. They're honoring their Lord. They're serving their master whom they loved. 
You see, we learn from this that Christ's love produces love. His sacrifice produces sacrificial love towards him. His salvation produces worship. That's always the order. It's always the order. You cannot generate love and worship for Christ. It's it's from the experience you have of his love that these things come out. Romans 5.5, 5, God's love has been poured into our hearts by the Holy Spirit. So if you are a Christian and you're feeling dull, dull at the moment, come back to that fountain of water and blood. Let me close. It says they laid him in the tomb. And I think there's, as it wraps up here, I think there's four calls for us from this passage, four brief things to the unbeliever. John wrote this so that you may believe, he says. So he places you in the valley of decision. Believe in Jesus for the forgiveness of sins as a substitute who dies for you on your behalf. To the unbeliever, it's a call to believe and be saved. Secondly, we see secret disciples now unashamed. And so this is a call for unashamed allegiance and faith for Christ. In Christ, to stand for Him bold, not fearful. Thirdly, there's a call here to unreserved worship, wholehearted worship. As we see with the extravagance that these men went to, there can be no reservations for Christ. There is no sacrifice that we can offer that's too great. So Paul says, Offer your bodies as living sacrifices. And lastly, Jesus burial encourages us as Christians to not fear death. This thing that awaits all of us, he himself has faced. He knows what it's like. Let me quote Milne. He writes this, Jesus enters in the full reality of death, not merely walking with us right up to the door only to pull back at the final second leaving us to walk the dark valley on our own. He comes all the way with us into the grey, after-death world of funeral parlours and the making of arrangements for the disposing of the body, the world of strained faces, hushed voices and tear-stained eyes. He's dead, buried, gone. What a comfort that is for us when we have to face death and we know that he didn't stay there. Lord willing, next week we will consider the empty tomb. Let me pray. Our Father, we just thank you for your precious word. We thank you for this record that's been left by John. I pray for those who do not believe, who are in the place of decision to do with what to do with Christ. I pray they would believe upon him. I pray that great act of Christ's blood pouring out 2,000 years ago would be applied to them even this very night. I pray your mercy would be upon them. And I pray for believers. I pray that those for those who are just secret disciples, ashamed to identify with Christ. I pray that you'd fill them with such a boldness as they, as they see Simon, as they see Nicodemus. I pray, oh God, that they may join the community of believers and stand and participate of the mission of the church in this world. And I pray for those, uh, Lord, who might be fearful of death or who are surrounded by death or death is seeming to be close, I pray that they may get great comfort from Christ knowing that he has gone before as they see him laid in that tomb, buried, lifeless. I pray that you would meet the needs of everyone who's listening for your name's sake and for your glory, that it would result in glory to your name. And I pray this uh, for Jesus' sake. Amen. Well, uh, attached to this sermon will be a couple of songs uh, that you're free to listen to, and I hope uh, the Lord blesses you all. Amen.